Before our scripture reading, I'd like to offer a prayer that we may understand scripture. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, move in us and among us as we listen to the scriptures read and interpreted. Open our minds and hearts to receive the living word so that we may be transformed to live as your Easter people. Amen. Our scripture today is from John chapter 14, verses 15 through 31. And again, notice the theme of the Holy Spirit in this passage. Jesus is letting his disciples know that he will offer them, bring them the Holy Spirit. Hear now God's word to us. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of the world is coming. He has no power over me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us be on our way. This is the word of God. Will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we are so grateful for your presence here. Within us, among us, in the beauty of your creation outside, you are present here. Help us to feel you, help us to experience you, help us to be aware of your voice of truth and your care and comfort. Guide us in our reflection together today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, in three weeks, we will celebrate on May 19th, Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost is the story from Acts chapter 2 that we read every year that shares with us that the Holy Spirit came and was poured out upon the followers of Jesus. And that start, started the movement of the church, the early church. And so in preparation for Pentecost, I want to reflect with you on the person of the Holy Spirit, that shire member of the Trinity, that part of the Trinity that sometimes we don't share enough about. And as I think about how to talk about who the Holy Spirit is, I realize I need to start with my own journey with the Holy Spirit. And so a couple things I want to say before I jump into my story. First is, some of you have heard the story before, 
And I talked to a pastor, a friend of mine, and I said, you know, I'm, I've been a pastor for a few years now and I'm preaching a lot. Do you, can you tell the same stories again? And this pastor friend of mine who'd been a pastor for 40 years said, yes, but share them in a little different way each time. I'm like, okay, so I'm going to do that again. This story you've heard before, but we're talking especially about my relationship with the Holy Spirit today, and so you'll notice that. The other thing I want to say before I jump into my story is that everybody's journey with the Holy Spirit is a little bit different. So the experiences I've had with the Holy Spirit may be different than your experiences, and that's great. So don't think when I tell you my story that it has to be your story necessarily, but do become interested in thinking about who the Holy Spirit is in your life and how the Holy Spirit might guide you. So my childhood, as many of you know, was in the Presbyterian Church. And I've always kept a foot in the Presbyterian Church all my life, really. And if I'm honest, I did know about the Holy Spirit growing up. But again, the Holy Spirit in my experience with the Presbyterian Church was that shy member of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit pointed us to Jesus. The Holy Spirit certainly was known as a comforter. But in terms of really getting into who the Holy Spirit was in my life, I didn't really think too much about the Holy Spirit, to be honest. But then in my early 20s, as I was in college, I was being connected to a lot of different Christians from a lot of different church backgrounds. And I started to get to know some charismatic Christians. And I realized that they talked about the Holy Spirit a little bit different than me. And I was curious about that. So when I graduated from college, it was 1994, and I moved to Seattle to be with my family. And my dad was part of this church, Bethany Presbyterian Church in Seattle, and it was a charismatic Presbyterian church. It had been strongly influenced by the Jesus People movement of the 1970s. And so there's this charismatic element of this church that we were really curious about. And it was the mid-1990s, and if some of you are aware, in the mid-1990s, there was a bit of a charismatic movement happening. And it was not just in classic charismatic churches or Pentecostal churches. It was filtering into mainline denominations like the Presbyterian Church. So there was a guy who, I think his name was Brad Long, if I'm not mistaken, and he led a group called Dunamis. And he was Presbyterian, an ordained Presbyterian pastor, but his group Dunamis would teach people about the Holy Spirit. His ministry is all actually called Presbyterian Reformed Renewal Ministries International, really long acronym, kind of Presbyterian of him to do that. But his program that he led us in was called Dunamis, and it means power. And I went on this retreat in Walla Walla, Washington with my parents at a Presbyterian church. They had this retreat about learning about the Holy Spirit and about charismatic faith connected to the Presbyterian church. And at this uh, little Presbyterian church in Walla Walla, I was experiencing worship with the group there. We were all learning about the person of the Holy Spirit. And in the middle of this worship time, I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit fall on me. And what it felt like was tingling in my hands, in my body. I felt this warmth and this sense of the presence of God. And I also felt this joy and this love. I started to shake a little bit. For you Quakers, I was shaking a little bit. And I felt this connection with God that I had never felt before. And I was like, oh boy, what is this? This is really interesting. Well, at that same retreat, there were a couple people who came up to me. We had a little bit of conversation during the retreat, but it was not a whole lot. And uh, they were charismatic folk, and they came up to me, and both of them said the same thing. They said, Chris, I need to let you know something. God has asked me to share a word with you. And the word is that you are called to be a gentle leader of compassion and boldness. You are called to be a gentle leader of compassion and boldness. And I'm 24 years old. And I'm like, whoa, that sounds amazing, and I don't know what to do with that, but thank you. And I remember even driving back to Seattle with my parents being like, wow, God is doing something in our lives, and what does it all mean? So then a couple weeks after that, we're back at Bethany Presbyterian Church, and we're having 
a normal worship service. After the worship service, a woman came up to me and she introduced herself. Her name was Jackie. And she was there really as a visitor of the church. She'd been part of the church before, but she was there to, to visit again. And she came up to me and she said, you have a pure heart like David's, don't you? I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know if you know how my heart is, but it's not that pure. But thank you for saying that. She's another, she was another woman who was very charismatic, happened to be visiting the church. And uh, that was at the end of that conversation. Nice to meet her. Didn't know if she'd be back the next Sunday. But two weeks later, she calls our family, and she says um, to my parents, I believe, at first, um, I have a word for your son. Can I come to visit your home? And my folks are like, well, let's talk to my son and see. And, and sure enough, we all agree that would be interesting. So Jackie comes over to our house for dinner, and she comes to me and she says, I have a word for you. And she says, um, the word is, you are called to be a leader of leaders. And I'm like, okay, God, I think you're trying to tell me something. Gentle leader of compassion and boldness and leader of leaders and then Jackie prayed with me, and that night um, I received a very small portion of my prayer language, which is praying in tongues. And it started off with these very simple syllables, Alani Rabaktani Omni Koni. And I went to pray that night, and over the next few weeks, as I prayed these syllables, they became a full prayer language, which is a whole other topic. But basically, it's just a heavenly language that is used in prayer. Pentecostals, Charismatics, other people have experienced it throughout the centuries. And it's just a way for me to pray um, that connects me to the Holy Spirit. I will say this is very humorous, is that when I started to pray in tongues, I learned to roll my R's, and I never could do that before. But whatever that means, I have no idea. But it was a powerful experience, and I was having these um, interesting ways in which I was feeling the presence of God. And so Jackie was now coming to the church, and so I started to get to know her. She led me in a Bible study to learn more about the Holy Spirit. And uh, we had prayer times together. And eventually, it led her to invite me to think about going to the Bible Institute that she had gone to. And that was a Bible Institute in Tulsa, Oklahoma, called Victory Christian Center, Victory Bible Institute right next to Oral Roberts University. And I felt like, God, you're doing something, so I'm going to check this out. I went and visited this Victory Bible Institute, this Presbyterian boy, and all these people were praying in tongues and having these experiences of the Holy Spirit, but I was feeling God. And I'm like, I'm going to check this out. So I spent nine months in Tulsa, Oklahoma, right next to Oral Roberts, the praying hands, and I felt um, just an amazing grace of God that year. I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. I saw miracles. I saw a woman in Monterey, Mexico, who had cataracts on her eyes, be prayed for by myself and another person. And the Holy Spirit was moving that night. And um, all I know is that when we stopped praying, she opened her eyes and she started to cry and praise God because she could see clearly. Now, we have surgeries to do that here in Monterey, Mexico. It, she would not have the money to do that. It was a miracle. It's a blessing. I saw so many things like that. But I share this story because it, it just, in my mind, it doesn't make sense that this happened to me. A Presbyterian boy who was relatively disconnected from an awareness of who the Holy Spirit was got immersed into a charismatic Presbyterian church and a charismatic retreat and had some people share more about the Holy Spirit with him, got immersed into Tulsa, Oklahoma for a year, came back out of that, and then got immersed into a very diverse group of Christian institutions, Seattle Pacific University when I was a campus minister, Fuller Theological Seminary. Eventually, I meet my wife, who is an Assembly of God young woman at Fuller, and she winds up getting a PhD focusing on ecumenical dialogue between Pentecostals and Catholics, and I've shared more about that story. But God had a plan, and God definitely wanted to help me know more about the Holy Spirit. So one of the things that happened when I was meeting with Jackie is that she gave me a book. And in the book was called Good Morning, Holy Spirit. It was a book by Benny Hinn. And I love that book. I love that book because the things that Benny Hinn was talking about related to my own experience. And I'm going to read a quote from his book. 
So Benny Hinn had a very powerful experience、um, in the 1970s、uh, when he was a young man, about the same age I was when I had this experience. He was at a Catherine Coleman healing ministry experience at a First Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Again, this Presbyterian connection just wows me. But he was at a special event. Catherine Coleman would go all around the country wherever people would let her preach. She would preach. So she was in a Presbyterian church, and in that service, he felt the Holy Spirit. Benny Hinn felt the Holy Spirit come upon him, and it set him on a course that led him to do a lot of the same kind of ministry that Catherine Coleman did. So here is a portion of Benny Hinn's book where he's talking both about his experience in that time with Catherine Coleman and in that、um, Presbyterian church, but also just his experience of the Holy Spirit. Period. So here, this、um, perspective from Benny Hinn: My eyes were closed. Then, like a jolt of electricity, my body began to vibrate all over, exactly as it had through the two hours I waited to get into the church. It was the same shaking I had felt for another hour once inside. It was back, and I thought, "Oh, it's happening again." But this time there were no crowds, no heavy clothes. I was just in my own warm room in my pajamas, vibrating from head to my toes. I was afraid to open my eyes. This time it was as if everything that happened in that service all rolled into one moment. I was shaking. But at the same time, I again felt that warm blanket of God's power wrapped all around me. I felt as if I had been transported to heaven. Of course, I wasn't, but I honestly don't believe heaven can be any greater than that. In fact, I thought if I open my eyes, I either will be in Pittsburgh or inside the pearly gates. Well, after a time, I did open my eyes, and to my surprise, I was right there in my same room, same floor, same pajamas. But I was still tingling with the power of God's spirit. When I finally dropped off to sleep that night, I still didn't realize what had begun in my life. Early, very early the next morning, I was wide awake, and I couldn't wait to talk to my newfound friend. Here were the first words out of my mouth: "Good morning, Holy Spirit." At the very moment I spoke these words, the glorious atmosphere returned to my room. This time, though I was not vibrating or shaking, all I felt was the wrapping of His presence. The second I said "Good morning, Holy Spirit," I knew He was present with me in the room. Not only was I filled with the Spirit that morning, I also received a fresh infilling every time I spent time in prayer. What I am talking about is beyond speaking in tongues. Yes, I did speak in a heavenly language, but it was much more than that. The Holy Spirit became real. He became my friend. He became my companion, my counselor. So you can see, when I was reading this reflection of Benny Hinn, I was like, "Wow, this is relating to what I'm experiencing, and I want to learn more." My wife Karen and I often talk about the value of the Holy Spirit and spiritual experience. But she reminds me that the spiritual experiences are valuable, but they really are only a means to an end. In Karen's book *Pentecostals and Roman Catholics on Becoming a Christian*, she writes about one of the conclusions of the ecumenical dialogue between Catholics and Pentecostals. She explains, "Experience is not an end in itself, but it is a means through which we encounter God." While experience is a valuable component of the Christian life, it nevertheless remains secondary to faith. Karen's book highlights that some Christian traditions emphasize Christian experience more than others. She shares, in the household of God, Leslie Newbegin identified the defining characteristics of Pentecostalism as a focus on personal experience of the Holy Spirit. Catholics perceive the Christian faith as a matter of the will. Protestants idealize Christianity as a religion of the mind, but Pentecostals alone insist that religion must be grounded in a personal experience of God over the intellect and the will. This again is a reflection by Leslie Newbegin, but Karen included it in her book. And I think this is consistent with my experience of the Protestant tradition to some degree. 
particularly among Presbyterians. In my experience, Presbyterians tend sometimes to emphasize the mind or the intellect over spiritual experience. And I know that some of you here are part of this church partly because the charismatic church experiences you've had were a bit wounding. And so coming to a church where we're open to the presence of the Holy Spirit, but we may be a little bit more calm in some of the ways we do things can actually be quite helpful. And that may be how the Holy Spirit is moving in your life. But I do think we have a challenge within the Protestant tradition and other, other traditions possibly, and that is that sometimes we, we worship the mind and the intellect and we fail to remember that we have a relational God and God wants to know us in a relational way. And that may experience various ways of connecting to the Holy Spirit and through, through our life of connecting to God and creation or our spiritual practices And again, God will meet us in different ways. I think it's good to be open to experience God through the Holy Spirit and to understand that the Holy Spirit shows up again in a variety of ways. And I wonder how you experience the Holy Spirit. Remember, we all have the Holy Spirit. We all have the Holy Spirit. Richard Foster likes to say we're all charismatic Christians because we all have the Holy Spirit. (laughs) And in our passage today, Jesus highlights that he will not leave the disciples orphaned, but that he will come through the Holy Spirit and bring peace. Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. One of the primary ways many of us experience the Holy Spirit is through the experience of peace. I think when people walk on our peace garden, they may not know that the Holy Spirit is there meeting them, but the Holy Spirit's there. The Holy Spirit is there because that place is bathed in prayer, my friends. That place is such a sacred, holy place. And if people walk on it, I think they feel the thinness of that place. They sense the presence of God. And it leads them into an intimate experience of the Holy Spirit that they may not even be aware of. But that is what's happening. I'm I'm sure of it. So peace is one of the ways the Holy Spirit moves in our lives. I want to highlight a few more things that we learn from our passage today about the Holy Spirit. And the first is, just like I received in that Walla Walla uh, retreat, the teaching, the Holy Spirit in the book of John, the Gospel of John, is shared as a person. Remember the Trinity, three persons, one essence. So the Holy Spirit is a person, and it's a great mystery, the Trinity. But it's okay to talk about the Holy Spirit and to relate to the Holy Spirit in a personal way. Just as you pray to Jesus, pray to God, Mother and Father, you can pray to Holy Spirit. Just know as you pray, they're all one, and yet they're also persons. And because they're persons... It's okay to relate to God in the masculine and in the feminine, and the Bible does that. The Bible does that. In fact, the Holy Spirit in the book of Proverbs is um, wisdom. And wisdom can be, uh, the name for wisdom can be Sophia. So, and in the book of Proverbs, you have a female character called wisdom who invites a male character Uh, to come into her home for a hospitality time of wisdom sharing. And it's a very intimate kind of warm and connection of hospitality. And so we see this imagery in the book of Proverbs that suggests that God can come in a feminine way to provide wisdom. So Holy Spirit can be viewed in the feminine. Same thing in the book of Genesis. When God created the world, there is this image of the spirit. uh, In the Hebrew, it's ruach. And it's, it's this beautiful way the Holy Spirit moves, and that can be viewed in the feminine as well, which makes sense because who understands creation more than mothers who help create uh, children, right, with their birth process? So I hope you can be okay with that because the Holy Spirit is revealed in Scripture as both masculine and feminine at different times, and you can pray to the Holy Spirit using either feminine or masculine imagery. When I pray to the Holy Spirit, I've used both in my life, and lately I talk to Holy Spirit as Sophia, and it's beautiful. So I'm giving you permission. Remember, I like to give permission giving. I always root it in Scripture, 
and I rooted in the Christian tradition, this is out there. If you like that and want to explore it, go for it. Another thing, so person of the Holy Spirit is the first thing I want to say in this passage. The second thing is that the Holy Spirit is mentioned as the advocate. And this is a beautiful word. Um, in the Koine Greek, the word is parakletos, parakletos. And uh, that word in, is, in the Koine Greek, it means advocate. It also can refer to comforter and counselor and helper. So think of the Holy Spirit as the one who can bring you comfort, counseling, who can be your advocate, someone who can plead on your behalf. Uh, in the midst of your life with all of its struggles, the Holy Spirit has got your back and is supporting you. Um, Lou today spoke about Corinne Leadership Program, uh, which is a ministry she helps partner with uh, in Thailand, and she talked about being an advocate. This was an, in her sharing at our adult spiritual formation class. And um, she's an advocate for a m number of Karen people, and uh, she has their back and she supports them. In the same way, the Holy Spirit is our advocate in our lives and is our comforter and our counselor and our helper. So when, you, when you're feeling nudged by God in your life, in terms of direction or discernment, or you just need to feel God's love in your life, when that happens, the Holy Spirit is caring for you. So that's something to remember. In our passage, we also read that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. Spirit, the Koine Greek word for spirit, is pneuma. And so this Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, is the one who guides us as well into all truth. So when you need guidance in your life, pray to the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom, to give you guidance, to be your comforter, to be your helper, to lead you into truth, including the truth of how to interpret the scriptures and how to be pointed to Jesus as you read the scriptures because the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus. And that's the next thing that Jesus says in his passage that I want to highlight. Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will teach you everything and remind you of everything that I have taught you. So when you're reading the Gospels and you're learning from the wisdom of Jesus, the Holy Spirit will help you interpret that and will remind you of how Jesus is active in your life and continue and will continue to give you faith and courage as you live out your life in ministry. Again, I want to highlight that that part where Jesus says, May, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Um, do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. He's saying, when I bring you my Holy Spirit, you will know the Holy Spirit through the peace that is given. And so remember that's another aspect of the role of the Holy Spirit in your life, is to bring you peace. So next week, we're going to continue to explore who the Holy Spirit is. This summer, we'll also uh, have Mary Kalesi and Lish Manitor be preaching on fruits of, fruit of the Spirit. And so just be aware, we're going to keep in this theme really through the summer in many ways. But I hope that exploring who the Holy Spirit gives you encouragement and excitement as we continue to see what God has for us. I want to invite you this week, when you wake up each morning, to consider starting your day by saying, Good morning, Holy Spirit. Let's do that together. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Try that. And have your heart open, your ears open, your, be listening, be willing to just see what God might do throughout your day as you seek to be open to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Remember, the person of the Holy Spirit wants to be known by you to be your advocate, to be your guide, to be your counselor, to be your comforter, to be your friend. Will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we feel you. We feel you in this place. We know you're here. We sense your anointing. We sense your love. We sense that we are not orphaned because you are with us that we can bring our loneliness to you, we can bring our lostness to you, our confusion to you, and you are our guide. You are the one who offers wisdom and comfort. So help us to become more aware of you in our lives. For ourselves, yes, but also that we can share your love with others and be the hands and feet of Jesus in our world. Thank you. Thank you for your presence among us here. We pray this in the name of God, Mother and Father, Jesus the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen.